Hello and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Jamie Sullivan. I'm the marketing manager here at LeoStream. And today we are going to be discussing how to build cloud-based VDI in AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud Platform with LeoStream. So today I am thrilled to be joined by our CEO, Karen Gondoli, who will be taking us through the demo. Um, for those of you who have not met Karen, she's been with LeoStream for over 10 years. And as CEO, she is very hands-on in helping our customers design and deploy their LeoStream solution. She holds an undergraduate and master's degree in aerospace engineering from MIT. So although deploying LeoStream for cloud-based BDI is far from rocket science, if it were, she'd be able to handle that too. Okay, so let's take a quick look at where we're heading today. I want to start by outlining some of the common pain points associated with traditional on-premises VDI. That being said, I'm sure many of you know firsthand what these pain points are, and perhaps that's the very reason you registered for this webinar. Um, so with that in mind, we're going to highlight some of the benefits from moving from a traditional on-premises VDI model to a cloud-based VDI model. Then I want to dive into some of the most common strategies we see when IT professionals begin their journey to cloud-based VDI and identify where some of those dead ends are. Um, and finally, Karen will bring us through a demo of how to build your own cloud-based VDI solution. So let's go ahead and get started. What are some of the drawbacks to the traditional on-premises VDI model? Well, it really boils down to one thing, and that it's expensive, but it's expensive in more ways than one. Server hardware costs add up quickly, and once you have that hardware in place, you need experienced IT staff who can manage it. It's expensive because of the physical footprint of your data center, especially that so many of us are moving towards co-working spaces or even fully remote teams. Many of us just don't have the office space to spare anymore. And finally, since we are discussing VDI, virtualization software. Full stack VDI license costs add up fast. If you've ever opened a renewal quote from one of the full stack vendors and had a mini heart attack, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So with all that in mind, perhaps the best solution for your organization is to trade your on-premises data center for a technology forward cloud environment because we all already know the benefits of the cloud. Trading the capital expense of on-prem hardware for a flexible pay-for-what-you-use OpEx model in the cloud, maximizing resource utilization by only paying for the compute when you're actually using it. A user goes home for the day, shut it down, and never pay for idle time again. Have a seasonal or temp workforce? Use a cloud-based approach to VDI makes it easy to spin up extra compute only for when you need it. Are you onboarding a new employee? No need to wait for their hardware to show up. One customer told us that implementing VDI with LeoStream took their new employee onboarding time from a week-long process to a matter of hours. And finally, these days, disaster recovery and data security are priority number one for system administrators. Um, hopefully, none of you were affected by the Chrome experiment last week, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, there is a link in the chat box to a blog that we wrote about it last week. Um, but these situations remind us that disaster in IT can take many forms, and having backup access to your business applications is absolutely mission critical. So you know you need to move to the cloud. The real question is, how are you going to get there? And what is cloud-based VDI really? Let's take a deeper dive and find out. Okay, so for this portion of the presentation, I'm hopefully gonna save everyone a little time. What I'm gonna do is step you through some of the most common paths we see customers take when they wanna move their data center or a client's data center to a cloud-based VDI model and where those roadblocks are. My hope is to hand you a map to the easiest route to the cloud. But let's take a look at where you might go first. The first move we see every time is the old lift and shift. This involves moving or recreating your full stack VDI solution inside the cloud. This may be a tempting approach if you have in-house resources who are already skilled at implementing and managing your particular full stack solution. But here's the rub, it's really expensive. If you're moving to the cloud, you're already paying for the compute servers, 
why add on an extra layer of complexity and licensing fees by rebuilding a cloud-hosted version of what you already had on-prem? Your move to the cloud should allow you to trade up in flexibility and ease of use, not add additional costs. The second strategy we see is moving to a cloud desktop environment. The key point I want to emphasize on this slide is cloud desktops are not an equivalent to cloud-based BDI. That bears repeating. Cloud desktops are not an equivalent to cloud-based BDI. You'll see a link in the chat box to an article Karen wrote recently highlighting, highlighting the difference. Um, that's the cloud tweaks link, but I'll give you the cliff notes here. Cloud desktops are fine if you have less than 25 one-to-one -one desktops. Almost no one does VDI like this. VDI requires careful user policy management, AD integration, high performance display protocol support, and most importantly, pooling. Pools of non-persistent desktops, which are perfect for call centers, classrooms, shared applications, any one-time use need, have always been the killer feature for VDI. So if you think a cloud desktop will suffice as a replacement for your current on-prem VDI, you're likely going to walk away disappointed. And this leads us up to our third and final strategy, and here is my shameless sales pitch. Build cloud-based VDI with the vendor-neutral connection broker of your choice, which is hopefully LeoStream. If you're unfamiliar with LeoStream, we are a connection broker. In other words, if you think about your traditional VMware stack, we are the vendor neutral equivalent of the Horizon Connection Server. Now, by pulling that component out of the VDI stack, you can now build VDI basically anywhere, on-prem, private cloud, OpenStack, and yes, AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud. No matter where you build it, your LeoStream environment looks the same and delivers all the key features that you find in your traditional on-prem BDI environment. Okay, so with all that said, at this point, I'm sure you're sick of listening to me talk and you're ready to see this all in action. So what I would like to do now is um, turn the presentation over to Karen and she is going to show us what it looks like to build cloud-based VDI in AWS with LeoStream. Okay, thank you, Jamie. So that was great, but now let's look at a real world example. And my, my demo environment here is built in AWS, but as Jamie mentioned, the, the same is true. You can do this exact same thing, whether you want to use Azure, Google Cloud Platform, if you have a hosted OpenStack cloud that you want to use, or even if you're using private OpenStack for people, that'll all work just great. But let me show you what I did specifically in AWS. Now we are talking about building VDI. So this isn't just a LeoStream demo. I want to show you what I actually did in AWS itself because there is a bit of uh, pre-work that you need to do before you even get to the LeoStream part. So here in AWS, the first thing I did was I created a private network, a VPC, for my desktops to live in. Now if you're moving to the cloud, you want to still maintain a certain amount of security, so you don't want your, your desktops to have a public IP address. That way they're exposed to the internet. Instead, you want to keep them nice and safely hidden inside of the private network. So here in AWS, I created myself a demo VPC, and then inside of there, I have two subnets. You'll notice one is my private subnet. That's where my desktops are going to live. And it's also where my LeoStream connection broker lives. That way, it also is not exposed to the internet. Now, it's important to keep the broker and the desktops on the same network because the broker needs to communicate with the LeoStream agents that are installed on my VDI instances. The second subnet is for my LeoStream gateway, and it actually does have public access. Now, obviously, I need to connect my users to their machines somehow, and that's the LeoStream gateway's responsibility. It acts essentially as a tunnel so that users can connect to the desktops that are hidden in the private network no matter where the user happens to go. So the gateway public subnet has access to both my private network where the desktops live, as well as it's accessible from the user's client devices. So that's a little bit on my network sub, on my network setup here. Now I also, for Kicks, I did create a VPN in my side of my VPC, and that's so that my users who connect into their desktops can actually connect back into the corporate internet so they can access the data and everything that's hosted here on site. So that's purely for access from the desktops in their private network 
over into the corporate data center. So the network is the first thing that you need to get set up, or one of the first things. The next thing that I did here was build myself a database. Now the connection broker itself, the Ostream connection broker, it installs on a CentOS instance, as I mentioned, inside your private network there in AWS or whichever cloud you use. And the broker itself contains an internal Postgres database. So if you're working through a proof of concept, you don't need to install anything else. You just can use the broker and it stores the configuration there. Once you move to production, you want to have a high availability situation. So you build what we call a cluster, and that's multiple connection brokers, all pointing to a common external database. Handily enough, that database can be hosted by your cloud provider as well. So here, for my environment, I built a very simple RDS instance inside of Amazon, and you see it's actually a very small instance. The database does not grow that large inside of LeoStream. So that was step two, built my database. Well, the next thing you need to think about is authentication. How are you planning to authenticate users to provide them access to your VDI environment? LeoStream does support a number of different authentication models, Active Directory, anything based on LDAP. We do support a number of different MFA methods as well. So what I did here in Amazon was I used their directory services. So this gave me a cloud-hosted Active Directory, essentially. I used, again, for my demo environment here, just their simple version that's based on Samba. But you can use any of their directory services offerings. And then because I do have that VPN connected up, it's possible that I could actually use my corporate AD for my authentication as well. So you have a lot of options when it comes to how you want to build that. So that was a little bit of priming the, priming the environment. Now we can start looking at actually building out some of the instances that we need. So obviously the first thing you need to do is build your broker. As I mentioned, this is just a CentOS image instance that I installed the broker on. It's a very simple issue, a single curl command, pulls down the stream bits and off you go. We do have an um, offering in the Amazon Marketplace as well. So if you just want to launch an instance using that, that makes it even easier. The second piece was the gateway. This is the LeoStream gateway, which again, installs on a separate CentOS instance. You know, it does in fact have the floating IP address, while the connection broker, again, it's safely tucked away inside my private network here. Now, the other thing I need to do then is actually build myself a master instance, an image inside of whichever cloud I'm using. So as an example, I created, in my case, a Windows 2016 uh, instance off of the base AMI that's provided by AWS. If you have access to Windows licensing so that you can bring Windows 10 into Amazon, that works fine too. Basically, LeoStream is agnostic to the operating system you want to use on your desktop. So it can be any Linux version, any Windows version. That all works just fine. So what I did is I created my master instance and then I installed the applications that I wanted. I put our LeoStream agent on it, that's very important. And I registered the LeoStream agent with my connection broker. And I powered it on, off and created essentially an AMI. So this is the image, that's my master image. So now if I wanna make updates, I just power on the master desktop, make whatever changes I wanna make and then create a new AMI when I wanna make changes to my desktops. Now, you notice I have a number of different types of instances in here uh, because I do demo a lot of different environments. We do support a variety of different display protocols. You'll see PC over IP in here, HPRGS somewhere in here. There's a Mech9 TGX desktop. And then I have a lot of machines that I just connect using either RDP or, or HTML5 RDP viewer, which is built into our gateway. So you do have that sort of flexibility. And based on the protocol that you use, you can assign GPU related instances so that you get really high performance uh, display protocol support and really good graphics for CAD or what have you. So it, essentially what that boils down to is no matter what your user's workload is, you can build an environment that's gonna satisfy it here up in the cloud. All right, so after I have my broker and my gateway installed and my master desktop and images created, now I can start configuring the different VDI workflows that I want to handle. And that is done through the connection broker. Now, the first thing you might be wondering is, well, the broker's hidden in a private IP, or hidden in a private network, how in the world am I gonna access that? Well, one of the additional functions of our gateway is to provide access to the LeoStream portal itself. So if I look over here at this webpage, 
that's actually the IP address of my gateway, and it's forwarded me into the login page for the test for the connection broker. So this is the LearStream web, web interface. I'm going to log in as the main connection broker administrator. Now, end users can use this web interface as well. End users can use a variety of different client devices. So there's the web browser. We have our LeoStream Connect client, which is a software-based client. You'll see that in the demo. And then we support a number of different thin clients and zero clients as well. If you do want to use the web interface, maybe you're a solutions provider and you plan on hosting this for some customers, this is, this is brandable. So you can take out the LeoStream logo, put in your own, change all the colors around. There's generally just a CSS file that you edit and you can, you can go nuts. For now, I'm going to log in as the main connection broker administrator. And for those of you who have not seen LeoStream before, the way this is set up is essentially just menus down the left. And what I always tell people is start and set up and work your way down. In the setup section, you hook us up to all of the other bits that make up your VDI infrastructure. As Jamie mentioned, we're a, we're a slice of that infrastructure. And in here, you hook us up to the other slices. The first is your authentication servers. So here you see that's the AWS directory services that I created. Now, the nice thing after I spun up my broker, you know, I created my, my directory services first, and then I spun up my broker instance. And so I went to add my authentication server and the broker automatically picked up the IP address or host name, I should say, of my directory services. So I didn't have to go dig for it. It was already there for me. So all I did was enter in credentials for a user who has permission to authenticate users and join machines to that domain. And then I can save it and I'm off and running. Now I have in fact hooked up to our corporate Active Directory server through here, because I, as I mentioned, I do have that VPN connection back into our network. Um, but for now, I'm just going to use our directory services for the purpose of this demo. So you connect us to your authentication servers, and then you need to connect us to your hosting platforms. And that's done through what we call centers. Now, a center in LeoStream is any 30 third party system that hosts your desktop. So in my case, I created a center for my Amazon Web Services US East region. I could also create a center for an on-prem virtualization environment, maybe some sort of hyper-converged system. The key is you can build a nice hybrid cloud solution using the different center types we have, and that gives you a way to allow users to go to one place to access anything that they happen to need across a hybrid cloud. The key when creating a center, which is for kicks, Essentially, all you do is point us at the center, and then anytime we integrate with the center, that means we use the center's native APIs to inventory the resources that are in there already, and then power control them, provision them, things like that. So we need to have credentials for a user that has permission to access the, that, that, those APIs. So in the case of Amazon, you'd create an IAM user with the required permissions and act, enter the keys there. As soon as you create the center, we reach into that center and, and see what you've got. And all of that shows up here down in resources. Anytime you see a resources page, it's essentially a big laundry list of everything that's in your LeoStream environment for you to manage. So any of my virtual machines show up here on the desktops page. And those AMIs that I have, you see it right there, show up here on images. Returning to setup, the last little piece that you need to do is hook up the gateway and the broker. After you install the gateway, essentially you just come into this page in the broker and then give us the IP addresses of your gateway. Very little that you need to do. If you're not a Linux expert, don't worry about the fact that our, we install on Linux. After the install, there's very little you need to do to actually touch those Linux machines. So in setup, you've hooked us up to all these pieces that you've created. And now in configuration, you define the different VDI workflows that you want to support. The first piece of that is pools. Now pools in LeoStream are very flexible and they have a few purposes. As with any connection broker that I've seen out there, ultimately users get assigned to machines and pools. But pools also control provisioning inside of LeoStream. So as an example, let's look at my pool structure here. Here I've created one pool, which is everything in my US East region in my AWS cloud. And then what I did is I created some nested pools in there. So I created subgroups. This particular subgroup here I'm saying is for, it's an example, non-persistent desktops that are used for a classroom. 
the contents of the pool is determined by the pool definition here, and that's dynamic. So as new machines appear in AWS or get deleted, we will automatically sort them into the appropriate pools. So here I just defined my pool as a subset of everything in US East that starts with the name student. And then if I scroll down, here's where I control domain joins and provisioning for those machines. So the first thing I've said is anything that appears in this pool, make sure it's joined to the domain. So if a desktop appears and it's on a local work group, we'll automatically join it to the demo domain and reset its host name to match the machine name. And then down here is where we're actually scheduling some provisioning to happen. And there's a couple ways that you can do this depending on the use case you're trying to satisfy. Here in the provisioning limits, I've set some static limits. So I've said, I always wanna make sure there's one machine in this pool, but nominally, I don't want more than one. You know, this is cloud, I'm paying for this compute. So make sure there's one for when a student logs in, but don't go crazy. But now let's say that, you know, that, that nominal desktop is there so that if a student is working outside of class, they can get to a machine. But what happens if, you know, once class starts? Well, if the class runs here, I'm saying it's running, my, uh, my broker is running in GMT. So in GMT, I said my class is going between 6.30 p.m. and 8 p.m. So at that time, I changed my nominal pool thresholds. And I said, make sure there's three and up to 10 because the class side is 10. Apparently, nominally only three show up. So the fact that this is green indicates that I'm actually in this time zone now. So these are the thresholds that the broker is adhering to. And you can see that over here in the pool information, it's spun up three. So that tells the broker, how many machines should we be maintaining in this pool? Well, then the next thing is, well, if a user logs in and grabs a machine, that means there's now only three that are available. Well, I, I need to spin up another one. How should I do that? That's determined here by the provisioning parameters. So here I'm saying I'm going to create more machines in my US East region. Here's my naming convention, very important to get that right. So my desktops appear in this pool. And then here essentially is the information that you would set when you're launching an instance directly inside of AWS. And so what you'll see here in the provisioning parameters will change based on the cloud you're provisioning into, but it's always going to be similar to the information you need for that cloud. So here I've said my base image that I created, I select an instance type and putting them in that private desktop network. Uh, I forgot to point out security groups and network, but I did prime my VPC with a few security groups. This one, the Stream desktop groups, it opens up the ports I need so that I can establish an RDP connection and communicate with the Stream agent. And then I'm also saying that these machines are deletable. This allows me to model that non-persistent workflow inside of the cloud. If I default, because we inventory everything in your region, we want you to tell us what are the pieces that you really think that we have the permission to delete. That way we're not, you know, your servers and everything are safe. We're not gonna mess with them. So that's my non-persistent pool. Now I also have a pool of professor machines. So these are machines for the staff. And in this case, you see again, I'm just naming them. I just happened to pick a naming convention, starts with staff. And I used in this case, the provisioning parameters just with the static limit to, to create a set of desktops that are just then always sitting there powered off, ready for the staff members to use. You know, the students, they come and go, but the staff, I want them to have a persistent machine. So essentially when a new staff member comes on, they get a machine out of the pool. And then once they're assigned to that machine, it's theirs forevermore but what the broker will do automatically is power it down when they log out. That way, when they go home at the end of the day, I'm not incurring compute costs in the cloud. So the pools and the provisioning require you to think a little bit about how do you wanna manage these different workflows and how do you set up these provisioning limits so that you can uh, optimize your cloud compute costs. And by optimize here, I mean minimize your cloud compute costs. So that's the first step, the pools. The next thing you need to think about is, well, okay, once people start logging in and get assigned to machines in that pools, how do I manage their session? The first thing is to define protocol plans. Here's where you'll tell LeoStream, how am I connecting someone to that machine? So as an example, here you notice the form is broken into sections. You know, it, here's LeoStream Connect, that's our software client. So if students have laptops or uh, you want to use thin clients that are based on Windows IoT, you can install our LeoStream Connect client and use that as a LeoStream client. But as I mentioned, web browsers work as client devices too. 
these different types of clients support different types of protocols. So what this plan is saying is, well, if a user logs in from the Stream Connect, use RDP. And here you notice I'm sending it through that RDP connection through the gateway. And I'm doing that because desktops are hidden in the private network. The way that RDP connection is established is defined by this configuration file here, which is essentially an RDP file. For web browsers, though, if someone logs in from the web browser, I want to get them to use the HTML5 viewer. You know, this is great if you've got people with mobile devices. Now they can just launch, you know, say Safari on their iPad and off, and they, off, uh, off they go. But again, I'm sending it through our gateway. And I'm using RDP, but our gateway does support BNC and SSH for HTML5 connections as well. So if you have some Linux, that works like a charm. So my protocol plans are all the ways that I want to connect users. My power control and release plans here help me optimize the usage in my cloud. So let's first look at power control. Let's, as an example, look at this one, shut down on log off. If you look at this form, and you'll see it in the release plans as well, the way it's set up is essentially based on these sections. Did the user disconnect from their session? Have they logged out? Did they go idle? These events are coming from the Leo Stream agent, and that's why it's critical that those desktops have the Leo Stream agent involved, uh, installed and that it's properly communicating with your broker, which again requires security groups set up inside of AWS and your other clouds. So the way this plan reads is it says, well, when the user logs out, go ahead and shut down their machine. This is the power control plan I'll use for my staff. So when they leave at the end of the day, the machine is shut down. I have another one here that's shutting down on release, and that can be used for non-persistent machines. Release plans determine how long a user owns a machine once they log in. So in LeoStream, kind of the way it works is, you know, a user logs in, we validate their credentials, and then we look them up in their authentication server to determine which pools they have access to. As soon as they request a connection to a machine, the broker assigns the user to that machine, and it's theirs until that assignment is released. And these release plans determine when that happens. Here's where you can really define all sorts of different workflows to help you optimize and minimize your cloud compute costs. As an example, I mentioned my staff have persistent machines. So here, again, you notice based on these different events. For a persistent model, user logs in, they select a machine from the pool, and now it's theirs. All these released pool options are set to no. So that assignment is going to be sticky. But even though the assignment's sticky, I still can do things like say, well, if they've gone idle, you know, after 10 minutes, they've wandered off to lunch and I don't want their session sitting open, go ahead and disconnect it for them. When they come back, they'll be reconnected right where they left off, but at least this way you've got that security of knowing those sessions aren't sitting there waiting for students to come and read off their test exams. As another example, let's look at this delayed release on disconnect and logout. So the, what this one is doing then is saying, well, if the user disconnects, you know, they just close the RDP session, they didn't really log out, give them an hour to come back in. Maybe they've gone to lunch, they're coming back. If they don't come back in that hour, now release the machine to the pool. Now, the thing about these events is they trigger one another. So if the disconnect invokes a release, that release invokes this section of the plan down here. And here it's saying, go ahead, log the user out. And in this case, I'm not deleting, but I could also, if I wanted, delete the machine after I logged them out. So you can see by nesting and uh, triggering these different sections one after the other, you have a lot of flexibility in determining how long the user owns the session, and then also what happens to it when they no longer own it. After you have your pools and your plans, now they all come together in what LeoStream calls policies. A policy is essentially a set of rules that says, let, let me look at the professor one, that says when a user logs in, what pools do they have access to? So here I'm saying I'm going to offer one desktop out of the pool of per persistent professor machines. But let's say I've, I forgot I had a new staff member coming on, whatever, and my pool is empty. I've used up all of those machines I've pre-provisioned. Well, you do have the ability to have a backup pool in policies. You don't need to, but if you want, you can. And then there's different criteria you can use to invoke when does the user fail over to that backup pool. In this case, I'm saying, well, if a professor, a traveling professor comes in and I forgot to create a machine for them, I'm just going to fail them over to the non-persistent pool that I have and see that's going to happen because I have this box here checked. When the primary pool is empty, 
please give them something from the backup pool. So here at the top, I indicate the pools, how many desktops from that pool, and then down here, I associate all those plans that I've created. And you notice the backup pool and the regular pool, primary pool, can have different behaviors associated with them. You know, if they log into their persistent machine, I want the persistent release plan. If I gave them something from the backup, well, when they're done with it, just delete it, spin up a new backup, off and running. Now, this policy is not doing it, but a policy can offer desktops from more than one pool. And that is important to keep in mind in the LeoStream environment because ultimately the user gets assigned to a single policy. And that's a little different from how some of the other uh, connection brokers out there work because you entitle, in those cases, you entitle users to the pool. But in here, users get offered a policy. So the policy needs to offer multiple pools if necessary. So we have our policies. Before we talk about how those get associated to users, let's look at locations. A location in LeoStream is, is a unique concept. And the idea here is it's essentially a group of clients, kind of similar to how a pool is a group of desktops. So in my case here, I have a client location, which is anyone coming in from a web browser. Or I have here anyone who's coming in from our LeoStream Connect client. But I can create these locations based on any number of client attributes. So maybe it's for a particular subnet. And that's handy because what I can do actually is associate and attach printers to the virtual instance based on the location that the user is coming into. And you do have some other location-based capabilities that you can leverage in Leo's trade. The last thing I'll talk about it before I talk about policy assignment is roles. A role in LeoStream has two purposes. To some extent, there, there are a few end user session permissions that it controls. So if I look as an example, here are my role, here's my end user permissions. I'm saying, well, I want to give people the ability to stop and start their offered machines. So that way, if they come in and they, they see their machine is stopped, they want to power it on, they can do that. Or if they want to reboot it, they can do that from their LeoStream login. But I'm also saying, also automatically add and remove the user from the remote desktop users group. Now, why, why in the world am I doing that? There's a couple reasons you might want to do that. One, I'm spinning up these non-persistent machines for students, and I don't want to have my master image allowing, you know, having people pre-populated into the remote desktop users group. Plus, the master image isn't on the domain, so if I want domain users to log in, well, they wouldn't be able to be added to that group anyway. So by using this option in the role, essentially when the user requests a connection to that instance, the LeoStream agent on the machine will automatically add the user to the remote desktop users group. And then when the user logs out, we'll, we'll take them out of that group. So that means even if you have persistent machines, this kind of gives you an extra, extra security layer because now we're taking the user out of that group. They just simply can't RDP to that machine unless they come through LeoStream. The other handy thing that roles allow you to do is provide role-based access to this entire interface that we're stepping through here. So here you notice there are a whole bunch of options here for controlling access to the particular pages in this interface and even for particular functionality on the page. So this way you can create, say, a, a desktop administrator who the only thing they see are the desktops in a certain classroom pool. You know, maybe it's the TA for that classroom. So you can really limit what they have access to using the roles. And this finally all comes together in assignments. So here's where you finally say, okay, who gets these policies? You notice here, I have two rows here. These rows are identical to the rows that I have in my authentication servers. Every time you add an authentication server into LeoStream, we add an associated row in the assignments tab. And here, the way this reads is essentially based on who the user is. And by default, we look at their member of attribute. Based on who they are and where they come in from, those locations we talked about, they get their role in the policy. So when a user logs in, what we do is we look them up, grab their member of attributes, and then we start stepping through these rows. And the first row that they satisfy, that defines their policy. So that ultimately defines the pools that they have access to. So if we look here, um, I have a, a domain administrator who has access to a machine that can actually, you know, this AD tools is a machine that can add users and groups to my, my AWS directory services. 
So I'm actually providing domain users with, or domain administrators with access to that machine through a Viewstream login as well. And then my students, well, I only want the students to be able to log in from a web browser. I want them to force them through the HTML5 client. So I'm putting their group going through a web browser, gets the student policy. Professors can log in from anywhere they like, and they get the professor policy. Now what happens if someone falls through all these rules? They fall down here into the default, and one of the options here is to prevent users login. So that way, anyone who you aren't specifically providing access to resources to, um, they, get, they get a blocked login. It just simply can't log in. So after you work through all those steps, the nice thing to do before users start logging in is just confirm that it's actually working. So I can come here to the users page and I can perform a test login. And I can do this before anyone's even logged in. I've created an account for Jamie in my broker. I don't think she's logged in yet, but I can simulate her login. And here you see the logic that the broker is gonna step through. So here's my text parameters up here. I found her in my demo active directory, pulled her member of attributes. You see that she's a professor. So, so she fell through the first two rows and matched the third. So there's her role and her policy. And then you can step down here to see the policy logic and ultimately the machine that she would be offered. So to see this in action, if I look right now, I'm gonna do something really quickly. I was playing around and I forgot to switch these back. So pay no attention to the man behind the curtain here for a second. Save those. So you notice Milo logged in yesterday. He already is assigned to a staff machine. There's still one more available here. So Jamie should be able to get a hold of that one. So let's go ahead and do a login through Leo Stream Connect for her. I just have to remember what I set her password to. We're going to find out really quickly if that was right. So now in the background, what's happening? You see she got staff too, just like it was said. It was hard to see there. That's the IP address of my gateway. And what you might have noticed really briefly, the RDP screen had that IP address and then a colon and a, a random port number. The gateway is essentially using port forwarding in the way I have it set up. So it picks a random port and forwards it through to the RDP port on the instant side. So I, even though I'm sitting here in my network, I'm now connected via the gateway into this RDP session here, which is her desktop machine. You as the broker administrator, you see all of this going on here on the system log page. So on the logs, essentially here you have a running tally of everything going on in your system. So here I can see Jamie logging in. She was offered a desktop. She requested a connection. That triggered the assignment. Uh, here's the gateway adding the forwarding rule, RDP connection. And ultimately, the LeoStream agent letting the broker know that, yep, she is logged in. And so now here on the desktops page, I'll see her name. And now because she's a staff member, my RDP connection go. Now because she's a staff member who's persistently assigned, even when she signs out, that assignment's going to stick. And now that machine's hers forevermore. So now what about a student? Student has to log in, in my case, through a web browser here. Mabel's going to log in and be offered one of the student machines. And now this is actually going to connect via the HTML5 client here. So again, in the background, she's being added into the RDP group and the connection is being established here. Again, here on the system log page, I see that all happening like a charm. Now, here's the interesting thing. I wanted a nominal number of three machines in there for students to grab. So as soon as Mabel got assigned to the machine, the broker said, oops, my, my threshold is too low or my I should say my nominal value is below my threshold. So it went ahead and it's provisioning off a new machine based on that master image that I've selected. And so there's the HTML5 client. Now in this case, if Mabel goes ahead and sign out, signs out, that is. Now the LeoStream agent is going to send the notification that that sign out is occurring. And because that was a non-persistent machine, the machine's being released and then deleted based on the release plans that I have. I should hand it back to Jamie because I've just been talking for too long. So I'm going to stop the demo there. <laughs> I can go on forever. If you have additional questions, you can always come back to us, but I will let Leo, uh, Jamie take it from here. Thank you so much for the demo, Karen. That was great. I think we all learned a lot.
Um, so just um, to kind of reiterate, and um, I didn't go over this at the beginning of our presentation, but um, just who we are and um, what makes us the experts in cloud-based VDI. So we've been doing this for 15 years. We, we are a vendor neutral connection management platform that specializes in VDI environments. Um, we are consistently on the forefront of any new clouds, virtualization technologies, protocols, um, and we really strive to always meet our customers' needs. Um, and that being said, our customers, we'll push to the next slide, mm -hmm. um, are, are really some of the biggest names in finance, oil and gas, semiconductor design, healthcare, media and entertainment. Um, it's, and that's because we focus on managing these really complex and compute intensive environments. And our broker, um, as we saw in the demo, is extremely robust and incredibly flexible. Um, I would say pretty easily the, flex the most flexible one available on the market today. So I know what you really want to know is how do you buy it? Um, so we sell both direct as well as through our channel partners, and we have a um, subscription pricing model as well as perpetual licenses. Um, if you are a small team who's used to working with a uh, managed service provider, feel free to approach your managed service provider and let them know that you're interested in the Leo Stream solution. We are happy to work with them. Um, if you don't have a managed service provider and think you might need one, we are happy to refer some that are in our channel network as well. And so I think that about covers it. Um, we do have... Um, a couple questions. Okay, so I want to take Bert's question, um, and I did want to mention this. So um, I don't want anyone to accuse me of false advertising. Um, Karen showed the demo on AWS. That being said, the same process you can use on Azure or Google Cloud Platform. So just because we demoed on AWS doesn't mean that you're not going to get the same functionality in Azure or Google Cloud. So thank you so much for that question, Bert. That was a great question.